All right, well, before, we, before I jump into the pool here, um, I want to do just a little teaching on baptism. Obviously, you know, when we, when, when we do baptisms here at, at Newbridge and at many churches, there's usually a baptism class. And, and really, the reason, one of the reasons why uh, we do that is just to make sure that everybody who is getting baptized understands what we are actually doing. That this is not uh, a means to salvation, that, that, that people are not getting saved here. They're already, they've already confessed that Jesus is Lord, and they're going to tell you and share with you the truth of their story from darkness into light. What was life before Jesus, and what is life like now because Jesus has saved them? Uh, it's, uh, we have six folks uh, this morning, super excited. Uh, they are publicly declaring uh, their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And now, as I've done in the past, uh, before we kind of get into this, we just, I just want to just share with you a couple scriptures that refer to uh, what we're doing today. There's a whole lot of symbolism when it comes to obeying Jesus in baptism. Uh, in many ways, it's similar to communion to its symbolism. That's what we do every month to, to remember Christ's sacrifice for us on the cross. And there's nothing magical about this water, right? There's no, there's no special potion. I have no magical powers. There's nothing magic about uh, this water. It's, it's, it's an act of obedience that we are witnessing today. And the truth that it symbolizes in each one of these participants' life that make it powerful. Uh, so I'm reading through the book of Acts in my personal Bible study. And just this week, uh, a few days ago, I read the story uh, in Acts chapter 8 of the Ethiopian eunuch uh, who is uh, on the side of the road there. He's kind of parked in his chariot. He's gone to Jerusalem to seek God, but he doesn't really know God yet. And so he goes there, and clearly he didn't find the answers that he was looking for in Jerusalem. And so he's, he's on his way back home, and an angel of the Lord uh, appears to the apostle Philip, and is direct, he directs Philip to go over to this man in the, in the, in the chariot, and, who is an important official, and he hears this man reading from the scroll of Isaiah, from the prophet Isaiah. And so he kind of overhears it, and Philip asks the eunuch if he understands what he's reading. And the, the, the official says, how can I understand unless someone explains it to me? Now, just as a side note, this is an important side note. If you want a, a good reason to dig the depths of Scripture and to learn it well, this is a great example of being ready to explain to somebody what the scripture is actually saying, what the good news of Jesus Christ is. And so Philip does just that. He, explain, he tells this seeker of the truth, the good news, and the man believes right then and there. And right after that happens, he's baptized. It, it's, I love this story. They're, they're riding along the road. So clearly, Philip, I guess, has gotten into the chariot and said, let's take a ride in your fancy chariot. And the eunuch sees some water, and he says, look, there is some water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? So he's, he understands now the prophecy of Isaiah, which is all about Jesus. He believes in Jesus. And he says, look, there's some water. What's going to stop me from being baptized? You know, I was thinking this week, I accepted Jesus at a very young age. I wasn't baptized right away. And I remember as I grew into my teenage years, I was like ready to do it for years. And uh, I was told I wasn't ready. And when you read a story like this, you see that there was no, it's not, I'm not, not, nothing against baptism classes. We want, to, we want people to understand what they're doing, right? But, but here is the process. You believe, and then you are baptized. That's it. That's what the scripture says. You believe that Jesus is your Savior and Lord, and you get baptized. And so they both go down into the water, Philip and this uh, Ethiopian official, and they get baptized. And suddenly, if you know the story, Philip disappears. Now, hopefully I won't be disappearing this morning. I don't know. 
But uh, the scripture says that the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Rejoicing. He was rejoicing. Paul says in his letter to the Romans to rejoice with those who rejoice. And that's what we're about to do this morning. Uh, I've had a chance to pre-read some of the testimonies that you're about to hear. And let me tell you, there is a lot to rejoice about today. A few more thoughts. One of the things that baptism, bapt, baptism sim, symbolizes is that we are cleansed and made pure by Jesus. Uh, Abby picked the songs this week, and all of those songs were talking about us moving from death into life. And that's what God does. And so this is a symbol of God raising us to to life, being born again in Christ. And so what our friends are acknowledging and testifying to this morning is that they have died to their old way of living and are being raised to new life, to a new way of living, which is really letting Jesus live his life in them, in their souls. And so believing in Jesus means that we believe that Jesus defeated sin and death on the cross, and because of that, he made a way for each one of us to be right with God and ultimately to live with him for eternity. And if we believe this, then we make a declaration for everyone to see. We go into the water out of obedience just like Jesus went into the tomb, and we emerge like Jesus did victorious. That is what our friends are doing today. One more quick thought. The Jewish people back in Jesus's day already had a tradition of baptism, right? We see this in the gospels with John the Baptist. He's baptizing people in the Jordan River. And and you might have noticed that John is always baptizing in a river or a body of water that is spring fed. And this is important to note because the Jews believed that the, the, the clean, cleansing ritual had to be done, the baptism ritual had to be done in what they called living water. Living water. Which, as I've already alluded to, is water that comes from a stream or a spring. It's moving. It's not stagnant. Now, huh, this is not living water. <laughs> This was filled up with the Southeast Morris County Municipal Utilities Authority uh, water, which I have that same water at home. It's okay. Uh, Hopefully, nobody works for the utility there. Uh, But they're about to descend into water and come out cleansed and pure. This is not living water, but we know, now hear me now, where the living water comes from. Amen? Amen? It's Jesus himself. And I, I'm, I want to remind you, and I am reminded of one of my favorite stories in John chapter 4, where Jesus encounters a woman at a well. And if you're familiar with the story, you might remember that Jesus, here he is at the well. He's really kind of not supposed to be there with a Samaritan woman. She's a foreigner, uh, and he's there. I think he sought her out on purpose, and he asked for a drink of water. It's noon. It's hot. And he asked for a drink. And this is what, uh, this is how she answered in John chapter four. Jesus answered her, sorry, Jesus answered her. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water, living water. And sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water meaning that well water, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And she responds, sir, give me this water. Give me this water. Friends, we're all invited to come and drink from the wellspring of life. His name is Jesus. He is the living water. And so this morning, our friends this morning are following in obedience and are going to testify of God's goodness in their life. One more quick thought before we jump in. Salvation is the beginning. 
Um, none of us are perfect. And when we confess uh, belief and acceptance and receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, that begins a process that we call sanctification. And sanctification, it's a fancy word, but simply it's becoming more like Christ. And we do that not with harder work or, or more discipline, although that's, there's certainly a, a partnership in there, but we do that when we, when we let go of our self-will and, 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 and self-determination and we allow Jesus to implant his truth and his life-saving transformation into our lives. It's a process that, will, that starts at salvation, and it will be going on until you and me take our last breath. So we're all on the road, walking towards Jesus, becoming more like him. There's no magic here, but there is power in the living water.